Yeah, we're not doctors or giving any medical advice. This show is intended for educational purposes only, and you should talk to your doctor about any medical issues. Now let's get at it. Welcome to Chat the Fat, where nutrition authors Nissa Gron and T.C. Hale are going to break down common low-carb mistakes. Let's chat all things low-carb, keto, digestion, and more so you can maximize your results. Hello, good people. This is Chat the Fat, episode four. I'm T.C. Hale, and I'm also here with Nissa Gron. Nissa Gron, you Nissa Gron. That's Gron. me. What's going on, I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I couldn't stop saying this ground for a minute. But everything's <laughs> everything's fine now. I'm I'm all I'm running late today. So let's pretend just for a minute that I'm really stupid and I have no idea what we're even talking about today. <laughs> today we are talking about low blood pressure when it comes to keto. Okay, good because Nissa Gran knows some stuff about low blood pressure and I she do. also knows some stuff about keto. So yes, anything new going on today? Um, my blood pressure is good today, so good that's job. good. <laughs> good job. That's always um, a number, job number one. Yes, job number one. It did take some time to get there, but if you or anyone who's listening has done any research at all about keto, then you probably know that it's important to keep your electrolytes in balance, especially at the very beginning of your keto diet. Um, so once you drop your carbs on a ketogenic level, you start peeing out your electrolytes. That's why you're peeing so much. It's <clears throat> not because you're pregnant, um, but you start <laughs> peeing out those elect electrolytes in mass quantities and losing them can lead to a lot of problems like dizziness, fatigue, headache, irritability, nausea, and all of the other symptoms that are associated with the dreaded keto flu, which I know everyone's heard about if they've heard about keto. Um, so we all know the solution to this, right? Just find your favorite sugar-free sports drink and drink up. Then you have Gatorade. <laughs> yes, not Gatorade that has sugar, but maybe G2 that's sugar-free. We could all drink that, right? Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, not so fast. So most keto experts out there will tell you that is not the correct way to replenish your electrolytes by drinking something like G2. Um, but is everything else that you are hearing regarding electrolyte supplementation in the keto mainstream necessarily right for everyone out there? Yeah, it's, it's really not. And, you know, some people are going to have a severe issue with this and some people it's not going to be such a big deal. So obviously the same thing is not going to work for everybody. Yeah. And of course, um, if you're in any world, not just the keto world, you hear doctors and health gurus talk about all of the problems associated with high blood pressure. And these can include cardiovascular disease, strokes, heart attacks, blood clots, or even death from strokes, heart attacks, and blood clots. Yeah. So obviously right. not good. Right. Those are, those are bad things. You don't want to sign up for those things. And that's one reason why we hear about that so much. Yes. But you really don't hear a lot about um, people focusing on low blood pressure. And I don't know why, because while maybe you're not dying of heart attacks and blood clots, there are some common symptoms associated with chronic low blood pressure. And these can include anxiety, depression, cravings, headaches, insomnia, fatigue, and sometimes even mental and emotional issues, which yeah. none of that sounds fun. Yeah, that's, that's not good either. And, and you know, the, the real thing that's going on with this is that for all those cardiovascular disease, strokes, heart attacks, and you know, all those things, there are medications that are available to treat those issues. Um, but there is no such thing as a low blood pressure medication. Like you don't see anybody who's like, oh, yeah, I just started taking low blood pressure medication. So they don't make that. So the problems that go along with low blood pressure are not in the training for the medical world whatsoever. So uh, most medical doctors don't understand that, you know, issues like anxiety and depression um, and even things that we hear about all the time, like cravings can be caused by low blood pressure issues. So are the medications, um, since they are prescribing some medications for like depression or sometimes even anxiety, are these somehow lowering blood pressure? No, most of them aren't. And, you know, there's, you'll hear about people who went on an antidepressant and they felt better. And uh, what kind of goes on with this is that um, 
we have a lot of episodes on all these issues. If you're dealing with some of these issues on the Kick It Naturally show, you can just go to kickitnaturally.com and search for like depression. And we kind of really explain how these things can kind of happen. But um, a lot of antidepressants work because the mechanism actually restricts the person from peeing out the salts. And it kind of makes them hold on to all of those extra minerals. And now there's more minerals in the system and that can thicken up the blood and raise the blood pressure and allow the person to kind of function better. So they actually, a lot of those medications can actually raise blood pressure. They're just not known as, hey, this is a blood pressure raising medication. You know, that's a lot of doctors don't even know that they have the ability to raise blood pressure at all. And, and you know, you go to your doctor and the blood pressure is like, you know, like 90 over 65. And he's like, good job. Yep. <laughs> you know, good job. Because you're not about to have a blowout. You know, you're not going to have a heart attack. So, a, a okay, good job. But he doesn't know that you, you feel horrible. Well, I have heard a lot of different recommendations to raise blood pressure, or we say to get more electrolytes. And thankfully, going on an antidepressant hasn't been one of them. Um, I guess so. Right. A lot of keto people don't know about that yet either, right. thankfully. And I didn't want to suggest like, hey, if you're going <laughs> on keto, just go on antidepressants because most people that do use those, they there's other mechanisms that make them feel kind of like a zombie, you know, but yeah. at least they're functioning a little bit better than they were before. Um, so in the keto world, everyone definitely talks about supplementing with electrolytes, you know, especially to get past keto flu. Um, but I pretty much never hear anyone talk about low blood pressure. So how do you think that low electrolytes and low blood pressure tie in together? So when you look at blood pressure, it's a basically um, the result is is a view of what's in your bloodstream, and it's usually um, minerals. Uh, sugars and uh, protein a little bit as well, as well as junk. You know, if your body can't get rid of junk properly and it's just accumulating in the system, that can thicken up the blood and raise your blood pressure too. But minerals are a big part of that. And there's, you know, a lot of people have trouble bringing mineral into the system or they're peeing out too much. And when there's not enough mineral, then the blood pressure goes really low. Okay. <clears throat> and why do you think that um, everyone talks about supplementing for electrolytes, but they never tell you to check your blood pressure? Because we I mean, know we talked about this on another episode that they'll a lot of experts will test something out, or they'll read about someone who tested something out that it worked for somebody. So they assume that that is going to work for everybody, since most of us are humans. We're not. We're not all. But most of us are humans, so they assume that that's going to kind of be the case. But we, we really talk a lot about, you know, that there is no diet that's right for every person. Even dun-dun-dun, keto is not right for everyone. I know I'm going to shock people when I say that, but it, it, it's not. And some people need to do some work to correct uh, some, you know, digestive malfunctions or other physiological imbalances before they can really thrive on keto. So we like to see people look at your blood pressure and that could tell you, you know, maybe I might want to supplement with a little bit of electrolytes while I'm starting off keto just so um, I don't get a big drop off when I start peeing out more electrolytes. But if your blood pressure is, is really low, um, like, you know, uh, if it's under 100, the systolic, the top number, your blood pressure is, is in the dirt. Like it's, that's significantly low when it's not even, you're not even three digits. Come on, we want three digits. Uh, so when that's the case, you might not only need to listen to them saying about uh, supplementing with electrolytes, you might need to boost it up a little bit. So I personally know um, living with blood pressure in the double digits for probably a good majority of my life um, that, when you lower your carbs, it actually drops even further for a lot of people. So starting a keto diet when you already have chronic low blood pressure can actually lead to a low carb or keto diet failure. And I think that um, that's because obviously we're talking about lowering carbs to ketogenic levels typically lowers your blood pressure. And for some people who start out on this diet, like maybe they're coming from the standard American diet where they're eating a lot of junk food, 
maybe this is a good thing and this can actually benefit their health greatly because um, they already had high blood pressure. So bringing it down could actually help them. Um, But for some of those people who already have low blood pressure, then making it even lower can just lead to you feeling, like you said, like you're in the dirt, you could feel really bad, have low energy, get headaches, which I had for years, anxiety, Mm -hmm. also had that for many years. So I definitely had low blood pressure, even though all the doctors told me that it was perfect. Right. Yeah, good job. And and the biggest thing, especially for if we're going to talk about keto failure, is is the cravings. Yeah, that's... um, Something else that I had for years, I always tried, I never called them keto diets because they were just either low carb or Atkins diets back then, but I could never get past the cravings ever. I would last like four or five days and then I would need some bread or crackers or some kind of junk just to make me feel good. And those cravings never went away, no matter how hard I tried on my low carb diet. Yeah. And the thing that's interesting, you know, is that when you eat something like that, you do feel better. And so people just assume, oh, I'm just a chocoholic or I just, I I have a sweet tooth or this is just what I, I just need this. And the reality is that we should do an episode on just cravings. We're probably doing that coming up probably. I thought you were going to say chocolate. (laughs) Yeah. We should do an episode on just chocolate. We can. um, Because that would be a delicious episode. But the thing with cravings is that, uh, you know, when minerals go low uh, in the system, the system can't really function correctly. But if sugar goes high, then that sugar can buffer the low minerals and, and vice versa. It works either way like that. So that's why people either crave sweet or salty because salty things can raise the, the mineral levels right away. So when you remove the carbs, now you have less blood sugar. And so that's going to lower the blood pressure just by reducing the carbs. But then when you reduce carbs, you're also bringing insulin levels down. And when insulin levels go low, a lot of people will pee out more electrolytes and they'll pee out more minerals. So now you have less carbs and less minerals, both contributing to your blood pressure going lower. And that's why people when they start this, if that occurs and they don't take steps to fix it, their cravings are going to be at, they're going to think they're insane. They're going to be like, I'm an insane person because my (laughs) cravings are so out of control. So do you think um, like those people whose insulin is going low and they're peeing out all the, all the electrolytes, does it not matter if they're supplementing like crazy? It's just, it won't matter for them. Well, it, it, it's at least going to help. You know, but for a lot of people, they're going to pee it out as soon as they dump it in. It's like they're dumping it in the top and it's just coming right back out the bottom as fast as it goes in. But um, I still say do it. You know, I I still say do it if you're going to really try to do keto. But we also like to see people take steps to fix those problems before they really try to go full keto. Do you want to talk for a second about maybe trying – you know, doing lower carb while you try to fix some of these things? Um, Yeah. So when I first started, I followed the method that you talk about where I was um, dropping my carbs to around 25 per meal. And I wasn't necessarily eating the real foods that I should have been, but just dropping it to those 25 carbs per meal was enough to keep my blood pressure at a level where I felt good. And I was still able to see the results that I want it. Now they weren't supercharged results where people think you're losing five pounds a week every week, but I don't even think keto's like that. Um, So I definitely had like, you know, a good stable one to two pounds of weight loss each week. And I felt good because my blood pressure was high enough because I had enough carbs in there to keep it at a sane level. Right. So I, I, I love to see people, you know, doing enough. And also when you lower your carbs that much, because most people are eating more than 25 carbs per meal. So when you lower it that much, you're also removing that big spike in blood sugar, which results in a big spike in insulin, which then drives all that blood sugar into the cells very quickly and you get a sugar crash. So when you remove those spikes and crashes, now you get this like more of an even keel of carbs that are sort of always available 
And that can reduce cravings in itself because the cravings really come in the sugar crashes. You know, somebody eats, you know, a sandwich for lunch with, uh, you know, potato chips and they really get a big spike and crash. And that's why by three o'clock, they're like, oh, I need a candy bar or I'm going to die. Which and, just, should it be? and just to be clear, because a lot of people think when you're saying these sugar spikes and sugar crashes that you need to eat sugar, you need to eat candy bars or drink pop and that's sugar. But pretty much any carbs that you eat are converting to sugar when they enter your bloodstream, correct? Right. So you could be having real food, but if it's rice and potatoes, then you're, you're creating uh, you know, a similar effect. Even if you're like, well, I'm, I'm having pomegranate juice and Dr. Oz said pomegranate juice is healthy, <laughs> but it's, it's liquid sugar then. Yeah. Don't listen to Dr. Oz. Can yeah. Say that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not very many people listening to this show are, are also listening to Dr. Oz and they're, they're not, they're not being, oh, what, who should I listen to? Dr. Oz and all the commercials on that show or something else. Okay. So everyone in keto is telling you to take all the electrolytes. They're not telling you why, but it, it is because you want to bring your blood pressure up after you pee out all your electrolytes. Um, so that's why we're doing it. Yet no one really teaches you how you want to test your blood pressure. And I think most people out there only know kind of what their blood pressure is because they are trusting the last time they went to their doctor's office. Yeah. And that's really not the best gauge of your blood pressure. Right. I mean, you go, you go to the doctor's office and you're freaking out. You're sitting in the waiting room. You're like, oh my gosh, I think he's going to tell me I need a face transplant. And I, I hope my donor doesn't have an overbite. You know, you're freaking about all, all these things that make no sense whatsoever. <laughs> and you push yourself into that fight or flight mode, which constricts your vascular system and raises your blood pressure. So you might go in there and you're like 120 over 80, nailed it, but it's because you're flipping out. So you want to see what it is when you're in the mode of being a human. And I also feel like maybe all the other busy moms out there can relate. Usually when you're on the way to the doctor's office, maybe you're driving in the car and that's the time when you're shoving down a dark chocolate bar because you didn't have time to eat before right. you left. Right. So if you just had a bag of Skittles and, you know, all, all that sugar or whatever it was, now your blood pressure is higher because the sugar is thickening the bloodstream. So when do you think the best time for people to test their blood pressure is? So this is what you want to do. You just get a blood pressure cuff at your local pharmacy or Amazon or something. They're like 30, 40 bucks. It's not an expensive thing, but it's going to be a huge help if you're going to do keto or if you have any of those symptoms we talked about and you can just take it at least two hours after your last meal and don't do it fasting first thing in the morning um, you want it to be at least two hours after a meal it doesn't have to be exactly two hours and just relax you know you could lie down even on the couch or just sit in a chair and relax for a minute and then you put it on your arm and, and you take your blood pressure and anytime we talk about any of these tests uh, we actually have videos showing exactly how to do any of the tests that we talk about doing on yourself in our almost free digestion course. You can just go to uh, kickitnaturally.com forward slash keto digestion. And the course is 50 cents. We just, it has a charge to keep out the spam registration. So you have to invest an entire 50 cents, but that'll kind of walk you through how to look at these self tests that we talk about and, and what the results would mean. But at least two hours after a meal, now you don't have all those carbs or sugars or protein, all that kind of stuff in your bloodstream and your body isn't like going crazy working on digestion because digestion takes a lot of resources. It's you're at a calm state and now you can see, okay, what kind of mineral do I have in the system? Let's see what my blood pressure is then. So if you are testing like maybe an hour after you just ate a meal, then it's likely to be artificially inflated, right? It could be artificially inflated or... Maybe you had carbs and you already have had your spike and you're on the way to the crash and your blood pressure could be artificially low because your blood sugar is so low. Make sense? Yeah. And I think also, because um, you said to go to the pharmacy, but that's not really fun for stay-at-home moms. So that is a really great excuse to go to Target because I know they sell them there as well. Right. I forget Target is way better. Right. Yeah. Target has all that stuff. Definitely go to Target. Yeah. Um, 
they should sponsor. They, you, they're so easy to get. They're every, like you can get it at a drive through Burger King. You know, they sell blood pressure cups now. <laughs> Maybe I'm wrong about that. No, they don't. Okay. Um, it's been a while right. since I've been to Burger King. <laughs> so a lot of health gurus in the land pretty much will tell you that you need to drink water. You need to constantly have a glass of water by your side, a bottle in your car, another bottle at your desk, and you should be drinking at least your body weight in ounces of water each day. But how is that going to hurt the people that have low blood pressure? It won't hurt them as long as they go on antidepressants because <laughs> <laughs> when water is something that we all need as humans. It's, it's a great part of health. It's, uh, it does a lot of great things. It washes out a lot of the junk from our body and our body is made of a high percentage of water. So we need water, but water also washes out minerals in the system. Um, so if you don't have a lot of mineral in the system and you're chugging this water, you're just going to wash away the small amount of mineral that you have and you're going to feel horrible. So is the answer just to drink diet soda instead? Yes, diet soda is much better. Now you, you want to, first of all, you want to know what your blood pressure is. That's why testing can be so helpful. But um, you may need more water uh, to fix certain issues, but maybe you don't qualify to drink more water yet. So maybe you need to take some steps to lift those mineral levels. Uh, improve digestion so you can pull more minerals out of your food. Maybe you're supplementing with some minerals. And then when you get that level up, then you'll qualify to drink a little more water. Okay. And I think it was maybe like a year ago, maybe a year and a half, um, there were some new blood pressure ranges that were put out by the American Heart Association stating that anywhere between 90 over 60 to 120 over 80 is the ideal range. Um, should we be concerned when our blood pressure is what they consider in an elevated range, which is just over 120 over 80? Yeah, you know, think about, uh, I'm not saying this is exactly what happened, but think about if like 50% of the population is in that range of, you know, 120 over 80 to, you know, 135 over something. So that's half the population that's in that range. So if they come along and say, we're going to change this so that now, uh, the highest you want to be is 120 over 80, even though that was the perfect blood pressure for the last 80, 90, 500 years, whatever it was. Um, ever since Omron went into business, that's who makes all the blood pressure cuffs. <laughs> so ever since then, that's been the perfect blood pressure, but now they're going to say that's the max and you're about to die if you're at 121 over 82. So if they make that change, what happens overnight? Overnight, there's a 50% increase in blood pressure lowering medication sales. That's brilliant. Yeah. That's really good marketing. You know, so uh, sometimes we have to look at, at what's reasonable. And you know, another reason they, they try to lower all these things and they do the same with cholesterol and stuff is because the, the cholesterol medications and the medications they use to stop heart attacks aren't working because they're not actually working to correct the actual problem. They're just looking to lower the numbers so a person gets a better score on their report card. So when they don't work, they say, oh, well, it, these numbers just are probably too high. If we just lower them more, everything's going to be great. The problem is that uh, what's going to happen is that we're going to see an explosion in antidepressant medication sales. And the crazy thing is that if you've talked to anybody who's been on antidepressants for more than a decade, there's a very high chance that they are now also on blood pressure lowering medications. Mm. So those antidepressants for so long raised blood pressure to the point that now they have high blood pressure. So now they're on blood pressure lowering medications. If you talk to anybody who's been on blood pressure lowering medications for a very long time, a lot of them are now on antidepressants because the blood pressure lowering medications pushed it too far. So you can see that what if we were just reasonable? You know, what if we weren't using two different medications that were like driving with your foot on the gas and the brake at the same time? You know, what if we just measured our numbers to look at them and adjusted a few things to, to get in the right range? 
So even though this number is coming from an association that we're supposed to trust, like the American Heart Association, it kind of sounds like a win-win for the pharmaceutical industry. It it sounds like it. Remember, I'm not saying that's what happened, (laughs) but it sure does sound like it. Seems to be a lot of coincidences when they're involved. Yeah, a little bit. (laughs) Um, And so... They're basically telling people to strive to be on that lower end of the ideal range, which is 90 over 60. So people go on keto, their blood pressure drops to 90 over 60. Are these people going to be happy and excited that they're on the <laughs> lower end? <laughs> well, they got a good score. So they'll be happy about their, their score. That they, they, Somebody patted them on the back and probably gave them a lollipop on the way out of the office. To raise their blood pressure? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But again, you know, so... Uh, a lot of people, they don't, they don't understand what's happening and they just think, oh, well, now I'm depressed or now I'm tired all the time or you know, now I can't sleep. A lot of the things that we see happen with low blood pressure and nobody's telling them that, hey, you might want to look at your blood pressure. Yeah. So I know um, a lot of people listening, maybe they're asking themselves, all right, so we're not supposed to supplement with sugar-free Gatorade, the G2. So if that's not the answer, then what is? And no, it's not also um, drinking Pedialyte because I know some people do that as well. <laughs> oh, no. I didn't know um, about that. <laughs> yeah, that's a, a great hangover cure. <laughs> oh, great. Um, so a lot of uh, keto experts out there will tell you to salt everything. Make sure that you're salting all your food with a high-quality sea salt. Um, place salt directly under your tongue so you can get it sublingually. You can add a lot of salt to the water that you're drinking. Um, And like I said, always make sure that you're using a high quality sea salt and not table salt. So a lot of keto experts also suggest that everyone in keto land should supplement with magnesium. And a lot of them are telling ketoers to take magnesium at night in order to help them sleep better. Um, And then a lot of the keto experts, thankfully, they're not telling people to supplement with potassium because that could cause some other health issues. But a lot of them are telling you that you should find potassium-rich foods and um, just not to pop potassium in a pill form. So the general advice is to find success on a keto diet and to, of course, make it through the dreaded keto flu is to supplement with these electrolytes. But as I just said, this is super general advice, and it obviously isn't always meant for everyone. Um, So obviously, if you go into keto and you have already have high blood pressure, and then you go and follow this advice and start throwing salt under your tongue or over-salting your food, it obviously is going to raise your blood pressure higher, and that can cause some of the health issues we talked about at the beginning of the episode. Right, and a lot of people with high blood pressure, it's like that because their body's having a hard time peeing out salts and removing filth correctly. And, and there, is a, there is a situation where if you switch to a high-quality salt, that all of a sudden it allows your body to use some of that mineral that's been floating around because now you have all these cofactors that allow your body to use it. And some people can actually bring their blood pressure down by using a higher quality salt, but I still like to see people fix the problem that's causing the high blood pressure before they start using a lot of salt because that doesn't work for everybody. And then, um, so one thing that I learned before I knew what keto was, so when I was just doing low carb, is that if you lean towards a catabolic imbalance, um, even if you have chronic low blood pressure like I did, supplementing with magnesium can actually make that catabolic imbalance worse, and it'll make it especially worse if you supplement with magnesium at night, like pretty much everyone says to. Right, because your magnesium is like the most pro-catabolic mineral that there is. And we won't get into what catabolic and anabolic is a lot in this episode, but catabolic is basically the state your body needs to be in during the day while you're awake and active so it can create energy and all that stuff. So taking magnesium at night actually works again against your body's natural circadian rhythms. So you're, you're working against your body by doing that. And, um, you know, people, it helps some people sleep because they're having trouble sleeping because their minerals are so low that the body's freaking out. Like it doesn't know what to do and it's going into this emergency mode. And so when you add any mineral in there, now you're lifting the minerals and now the person might be able to sleep a little bit. But there are other causes of insomnia that can be greatly magnified 
by magne- mag- magne- magnesium. So you really want to take that during the day. And again, um, this is another thing we teach how to look at when you look at your self-test is to figure out if you're too catabolic or not. Because the reality is that most people need a little magnesium these days just because it's not as available on our food source as it, as it used to be. And so it's an important mineral, but there's a big difference between getting a little bit of magnesium and in the day and um, getting more from food by digesting it better and supplementing with a whole bunch of magnesium because that can cause a lot of problems for a lot of people. Yeah, I think, um, you know, thankfully I already knew better, so I never fell into that trap because when I started following keto and reading all the keto books, pretty much you, that's the only thing people recommend is take magnesium, take lots of it, or you're going to feel bad. And I never took it. And I think if I did take it, it would have made it harder for me to sleep and more headaches and just right. bad things. You were, already, you were already lean and catabolic, right? Very strongly. Yeah, I had a hard time fixing that. Right, sure. right. So you would have definitely not fixed it if you were listening to all the keto dudes. Yes, exactly. Well, there, there, yeah, there are some women in there. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so assuming that the general advice regarding electrolytes happens to be right for those people who are listening, so meaning that maybe you can benefit from more sea salt and taking magnesium isn't going to throw your body chemistry further out of balance, if you do have chronic low blood pressure, why is supplementing with these for long term typically not enough to find success with keto? Why don't you start talking about what happened with you a little bit? Well, for me, I was already fixing my digestion. So back in the day when I tried low carb diets and um, I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> um, when you were working on lifting your blood pressure and uh, oh, okay. with minerals and stuff. Sorry. My name's Tony. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> I have mold brain. I have oh, good. Excuse. Good job. Awesome. <laughs> um, okay. So yeah. So when I was doing low carb diets in the past, um, and I was, I didn't have high enough electrolytes. I would just always go back to the cravings, of course, and then I would feel bad. I'd get tons of headaches and, um, you know, even taking the salt, it was never enough salt for me long-term. Like I even went through this really bad stage. I saw a tip in a Facebook group that you shouldn't follow a lot of those tips in Facebook groups for this exact reason. Um, but someone said to put a lot of salt in those little capsules so I bought my own capsules and I put salt in it and I took it and I was fine. And, you know, I thought, oh, cool. Now I don't, cause I didn't like a lot of salt on my food. I'm like, now I don't need to salt my food. I'll just put it in capsules. And I was fine for like a day or two. My husband took the advice and he immediately threw up everywhere. <laughs> That's beautiful. Yeah. And he blamed it on the salt, but I'm like, no, it can't be the salt I've been taking. I was fine. And then a day later, yeah, it didn't go so well for me. Um, <laughs> So yeah, bef- before my before I took HCL long enough to actually help me out, it just seemed like I couldn't get enough salt to help me stick with a low carb plan. Right, and you know, salt is probably one of the most helpful things. But for a lot of people, again, they're, they're peeing it out as fast as you're dumping it in. And what you really want to do is because the food that we eat has a lot of mineral in it. If you're not getting it from a vending machine and it's real food, uh, it has a lot of minerals that can, it's what the body wants. So the trick is to be able to break that food down so that you can actually pull the minerals out. So a person really needs to make sure they're not having any digestive symptoms or digestive issues that are showing signs of an inability to pull minerals out of the food. And once you fix that, now you have a more steady stream of actual usable minerals coming in and it's not just the minerals that are found in in sea salt. You know, again, those can be really helpful, but uh, most people need to fix the actual problem so that they can get a wider variety of usable minerals. And so now um, for those people who are just starting out and say they didn't have the luxury like I did to work on my digestion for a full year before I even knew what keto was, If these people have chronic low blood pressure, can they just jump into keto diet and take more supplements and, you know, just eventually they'll get it right? They they can and people do and they often suffer greatly. Or they, two weeks later when they realize that they've gained eight pounds, they say, I quit. This is stupid. I'm 
uh, I'm going to go back and uh, count my calories while I'm watching Dr. Oz. So (laughs) that's why we don't like people to do that. It's not saying that nobody can succeed doing that. And we're not saying never do that. We're just saying never do that (laughs) because you want to work with your body. You want to be giving your body uh, uh, nutrients that it can utilize. And if your digestion isn't working well to pull minerals out of the food or to even process the fats correctly, now you're eating all these fats, it's, you're causing a lot of trouble. So we like to see people fix those issues and then go on keto um, so that they can actually succeed and then they get to experience all those things that are so amazing that everybody talks about. And I think um, a lot of people, I know they, they come to a keto podcast to learn how to keto correctly. And now we're telling them not to keto if they have low blood pressure, because there's a lot of people out there with low blood pressure. Um, but they will be happy to know that there are some things that they can do in order to raise their blood pressure while still finding success with a uh, lower carb plan long term. And so some of these I know you've talked about a lot is adding more medium carb foods like sweet potatoes or berries to their plan. Mm-hmm. Um, I know those are your go-tos. Are there any other good ones that they can There's add? a lot, you know, things like butternut squash and, and Brussels sprouts. And, um, you know, I've even seen people use, you know, I, I hate people using things like these low carb breads and stuff like that. Um, but if it's, if you're eating Zagnut bars every day, then that's a step in the right direction. So if you're making steps in the right direction, good job, you know? Yeah, that was the transition I took it. I don't think I ever had a Zagnut bar, but you know. Eating- <laughs> I'm not sure they even make Zagnut <laughs> bars anymore, but that's fun yeah. to say. I, I, ate the, I went from the really bad junk fast food to a little bit better, and then I just kept improving over time, and now I don't even recognize the diet that I currently eat. It's so healthy. <laughs> right, right. And, and so if, if this is a step that helps you, don't feel like, oh, man, I can't do keto. You're just, your transition is going to be much slower because you're going to be working on fixing physiological things that are not working correctly um, while you're lowering your carbs lower than they were before, you're still going towards keto, um, but you want to set yourself up to succeed on keto instead of being miserable on keto, gaining weight on keto, or failing and quitting keto. And so another thing that they can do is they can keep their blood sugar on a more even keel by avoiding larger insulin spikes throughout the day. Um, So that would be eating those medium carb foods we just talked about instead of the Zagnut bars or even the slices of bread. Right. Um, and then also we talked a little bit about taking the steps to properly digest their food. So their body has the ability to pull out nutrients. And so the way that I did that and the way that you talk about is by supplementing with beet flow and beatine HCL, which will help break your body down or break your, well, it'll help break your food down so your body right. can use it. Interesting you say that because when people can't digest their food, they're actually often breaking down their food and that's the nutrients that their body is using. Um, we talked about this a lot and was it episode two? Um, yeah, the episode about fat. Okay, we may have got into that some. So you can go to uh, chatthefat.com episode, uh, chat the, chatthefat.com forward slash episode two. Uh, to hear more about that. And I think we're going to talk about uh, some protein digestion stuff next week, I think. Yeah. Okay, oh, cool. and then w- one more step is um, to add an easy to assimilate minerals and, and nutrients from something like bone broth, which we haven't talked all that much about. Yeah. And that's a really big one um, because, you know, when it cooks in the pot like that for a while and starts pulling all those neutrals out, nutrients out of the bones and the other food in there, then it's easier for your body to use those nutrients. Are you, are you going to add a, a link to a video about that? Yes. So um, bone broth, you can buy a lot of good high quality bone broth, but it's like $10 for two servings and right. that's a lot of money. Um, so there definitely is an easier way that you can actually, you can make it from bones. Or I recently learned that maybe about a year ago that you can make it from a whole chicken in the crock pot. And so that's actually kind of interesting to watch. So I'll definitely add a video on how to do that. And that way it doesn't cost much. And you're also meal prepping at the same time because you're cooking the chicken in the crock pot. Right. So that's awesome. So um, we'll put that link on the show notes page. So you can go to uh, chatthefat.com forward slash episode four. 
All right. And so, I mean, we kind of already talked about this, but why do you think that a lot of people to be successful in keto long-term need to incorporate all of these steps in lieu of just throwing more salt at it? Like, can't they just swallow the salt pills like I talked about and call it a day? (laughs) Right. And the thing is, is that uh, a lot of people will think that they can because there will be people out there who do that and it works for them. You know, I've, I've had people, clients change their life by just adding sea salt, you know, um, because it has the ability to fix a lot of things that may be going wrong with digestion even. So if a person is just needing a little boost, it helps them. But for most people, they need a lot more than just a little sea salt. Okay. And so the people that find keto and they want to start right away, um, if they typically have low blood pressure, they want a timeline. How long can they follow this before they can really do keto hardcore? Yeah, and people always want answers to questions like that, and they, 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 they just aren't there. They're not there because uh, you, you need to look at you. You don't need to look at your neighbor and what's happening with them. You need to look at you and your physiology. So if you can start looking at your blood pressure and how it's doing, and if you're taking these steps and it starts to creep up a little bit, then maybe you can start testing some things out. But if you, if you test out keto and then you feel horrible, you also get to look at your blood pressure and you're like, wow, I didn't know blood pressure went down to 75 over 50. You know, and you're like, now all of a sudden, when you're feeling lousy, it makes sense. So that's what we want. We want things to make sense. So it's all about just monitoring your progress and monitoring your physiology so you know okay, maybe I'm not ready for this and I need to work on this a little longer or, hey, this is going okay. I'm going to keep going. All right. And I think um, that about sums up what we have to say about low blood pressure and keto. Um, We did put together a guide on how to avoid keto flu, which if you're at the start or sometimes even if you're in the middle, it's actually really important to know all the steps to take to avoid that because no one wants to feel bad for a few weeks. Um, So we are going to add that download to the episode links. And what is that? Chatthefat.com slash? Episode four. Episode four. Okay. And you can download that free there. Yeah. So we have that for you. And then we also have a listener question. Um, So we have Rose from Billings, Montana. And she said, can you explain why I get body aches and pains on keto without working out or exercising? Is it a sign of ketosis or fat burning, or is it a sign that something is wrong? So there's a number of things that could be happening here. You know, uh, a lot of times, uh, let's say a person is just peeing out all their minerals. Let's just use that as an example. Now the body still needs those minerals to function correctly. So when it doesn't have things available that it needs, it shops at 7-Eleven to get those things because it's convenient and the 7-Eleven happens to be your body. So the body will actually break itself down and muscle and tissues and even lung tissue and all this kind of stuff um, to access either more protein or um, more minerals that it needs so that everything can function correctly. So that's kind of what a workout is, is you're kind of breaking down tissues when you work out. You're actually creating little tears and then you know, those uh, rebuild and repair, and that's kind of when you get sore. So if your body is accessing nutrients from you, it can actually create soreness as if you had a workout. Uh, Another issue is that um, you could be creating an imbalance um, by uh, reducing all of your carbs. Um, It can create like this overly alkaline situation that can make the tissues then too acidic. So that's way more complicated than we'll get into uh, here. But we do talk about that and how to self-test and figure out if that's an issue for you in the almost free um, digestion course. Do you have anything to add to what I'm talking about here with Rose's question? Um, no, I think this is all you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So it's it, it could be an issue of just the lack of minerals. And that can be part of that thing that they say about keto flu is you just feel like you know, tired and, and you have the flu and like you ache and all those things. A lot of those issues, uh, it's not like, oh, let's just call it keto flu and wrap it up in a ball and that's what we call it. it. There's actually things going on that the body is doing that's creating that discomfort. So again, look at 
your measurements and see where you are. And if your blood pressure is super low, then all of a sudden things like that make a lot of sense. And you can just take steps to supply your body with the minerals it needs instead of making it shop at your 7-Eleven of muscle tissue. <laughs> so typically, if people find ways to balance their chemistry, then those aches and pains will be much less. Right. Or go away completely is kind of what we're shooting for. Okay. All right. Well, that is what we have to say. So this week, we decided that we are going to start reviewing some of these keto products that are out there because there's a ton out there. And if you just purchase them on the fly, a lot of them are expensive. So you don't want to spend a lot of money on something that hasn't been tested. So you are going to be using our very expert opinions right, right. on these products. And we won't always be nice. So we'll apologize ahead of time for any manufacturers who accidentally <laughs> made a stupid product. Yeah, because there, there have been some that <laughs> I definitely wouldn't get again. Um, but we are going to start this off on a positive review. And so I am actually new to drinking coffee. Um, I never liked it growing up. I just couldn't stand the taste. And when I was in my 20s, I had a major addiction to low-carb monster. Mm -hmm. So that's where I got my caffeine from was drinking one or two low-carb monsters every day. Obviously, that is not great for your health. So I desperately wanted to find a way to drink coffee. Um, but I could never really get past the taste of it. So I, like if I did drink coffee, I always had to add a lot of heavy cream to it or sometimes even stevia. I don't do that now, but back in the day I did. Um, but I've been trying to find a way to get better ingredients in, especially um, since recently I was on an elimination diet and I wasn't drinking heavy cream as much. And so I snuck some of my husband, it's called fat coffee. Um, have you tried this at all? I haven't because, uh, and this will be a, a totally Nissa review because when I drink coffee, I'm, uh, I'm awake for three weeks. Oh, wow. <laughs> so I just, I just do, I'm not a coffee guy. Okay. Well, my, my husband is like, he drinks coffee, like from the second he wakes up until the second he goes to bed. <laughs> wow. um, yeah. And he's got all the fancy coffee wear and everything. So I definitely trust his opinion when it comes to coffee, especially since I'm not a coffee drinker myself. Um, so he was getting these, they're nutrition, Ninja Goat Nutritionals, um, fat coffee. And basically they put the butter in there for you. So, I mean, a lot of people have bulletproof coffee with fat in it. Um, they'll add like butter, coconut oil, MCT oil, things like that. And so he was getting these because he travels a lot. So it's really easy. You can see he was, oh, that's cool. he was a barbarian when he opened it. Uh -huh. <laughs> but they come in these individual packets. So this one here is just the, um, the fat itself. And so this one actually has organic ghee, organic virgin coconut oil, MCT oil, powdered goat's milk, which I never knew I had, but now I do. Um, organic cocoa butter and organic ground vanilla beans. Um, so they have different flavors, but this is the one he gets the most, but they also have an instant coffee. So for me, a non-coffee drinker, it was kind of like my gateway drug into coffee at home. Mm -hmm. um, instead of going to Starbucks and having to get like all the heavy cream and the sweeteners at it, I basically started making the instant coffee with some hot water and I actually really like the taste. So coming from someone who doesn't like the taste of coffee at all. It was really easy to um, enjoy this coffee. And so not only is it easy to take to go, but um, I also make it at home and I have this little coffee stir. That, oh, that's like a battery operated kind of thing. Yeah, it makes it frothy. I sometimes take it to go too, but I broke one in my purse. So I, <laughs> I usually just stir it. They actually have on their website an idea where you can take your coffee pour it into a bottle, like an empty bottle of water with no water in it and pour the fat coffee in and then shake it up. So if you're on and the then go. Dump it. Okay, yeah. nice. Sweet. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you, you like this one then? I like it. I would recommend it. I know um, we actually did a video about it in our Keto Decoded cooking courses. And I know a few people from there really enjoyed the video. And so they tried it. And I know that they've all had positive things to say about it as well. Um, and it's a great company. They tell you that um, they s support the community and they do all the best ingredients. They actually support um, workers on the autism spectrum to help them out get jobs. So that's all good. Good things. Okay. 
Cool. So there's one that we were nice about. Look at that. <laughs> See, we're very nice. And we'll try to, we'll put the links to these uh, products that we review on our site. Uh, we'll put it on uh, chatthefat.com forward slash reviews if you would want to go there and see uh, other products we review and stuff and maybe some that we'll like and some that we probably won't like yes okay so i think we did it we did a show we did we made it through okay so what are we going to talk about next week um next week we are going to talk about digesting protein on a keto diet and uh, later this week do you have an episode that you're talking about more about your experience with low blood pressure I do, since obviously we made comments all throughout this podcast about my experience with very low blood pressure for most of my life. Um, I did put together an episode that is all about me again. Okay, sweet, good. Because people, that's, that's, that's very helpful when you can actually learn through somebody else's experience. So that'll be good. So that'll be out uh, a little bit later this week, and it'll be episode 4.5. So we will see you guys next week, and we will protein it up then. All right, bye. Bye-bye. Whether you're brand new to keto or just looking to move past roadblocks, join us for our next Troubleshooting Keto Master Workshop. Go to chatthefat.com slash workshop to find upcoming dates and register for this totally free event. You just might find your missing piece of the puzzle. Until then, we'll see you next week on Chat the Fat.